We have just a stellar lineup of speakers. It's amazing. So now we go to Dr. Nick Wilding, a historian of science with a special interest in the history of the book. He has held fellowships at the Medici Archive Project, Stanford, Cambridge, Columbia, the American Academy in Rome, and the Rare Book School. Dr. Wilding has recently published a study of the real person that lies behind the character of Segredo in Ga Galileo's own Dialogo. In 2012, Galile Wilding was able to prove that a special copy of the Sidereus Nuncius, the starry messenger of Galileo Galilei, which contained ink drawings of the moon, uh, was actually a forgery. Dr. Wilding was not persuaded by a, a team of international experts, a dozen distinguished international experts who had just published two authoritative monographs authenticating the copy based on scientific study and forensic evidence. So this captivating story is now told in Dr. Wilding's latest book, Fossaire de Lune. He will share that story with us now in a talk entitled Forging the Moon. Now this story is more than a whodunit. It is that. And we can appreciate it as a mystery story, but at its heart, the meaning is far more profound. It is a story about the responsibility of a university to preserve the reliability of our data, our primary sources, on which all knowledge creation depends. So let's welcome Dr. Nick Wilding to the Galileo's World Symposium. Thank you very much. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Oh, that's bad. I'll do that a bit. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me and for coming along today. Um, I like to pace a bit. I'll come into the light a bit, unless that's going to give feedback. Uh, the story I'm going to tell today is a kind of blow-by-blow -blow account of this process of authentication and then deauthentication of a single copy of Galileo's Sidereus Nuncius. But as you'll see towards the end, it's not just a single forgery we're dealing with. Uh, this is part of a story of maybe two dozen forged books that are uh, on the market. Uh, and it's probably a precursor to waves and waves of uh, future forgeries. So uh, it's quite a serious uh, scenario. The art history world has been dealing with this for decades, or centuries. Um, but rare book forgery hasn't been that uh, prevalent, but I think we're about to um, to be inundated. So we need to um, work out what the best tools are to spot these kinds of objects. So, in 2005, a copy of Galileo's Sidereus Nuncius, this groundbreaking, cosmos-changing wor work, first published in Venice in 1610, arrived in the international book market. Uh, what made it special was that, do I have a laser? Well, it doesn't matter. Uh, there's a, a library stamp on, uh, that features twice in the book, and it's Prince Chase's uh, library. So the book had really good provenance. Galileo's patron owned this book. It also has an inscription at the bottom saying, Io Galileo Galilei F. Um, which means I, Galileo Galilei, uh, did this or made this. This is how Renaissance artists used to sign themselves off. Um, and most important, the work had, um, whereas about 24 of the original 550 copies that were printed of uh, the Sidereus Nuncius failed to go through the uh, press um, so most copies, almost all copies, have these etchings of the moon in them. 24 copies, we know from Galileo's correspondence, didn't go through the press a second time or through a different press. You print type and woodcuts on one press, but etchings have to go through a higher pressure press. So some copies didn't go through the press a second time and had blanks there. This one copy that appeared in 2005 
had watercolors in their places. And they're quite pretty watercolors. They're like lovely sepia photographs of a, from the Baroque era. Uh, and they have a very interesting relationship to the uh, printed images. In uh, 2007, the German art historian Horst Bredekamp, probably the most famous art historian in Europe for early modern, uh, early modern art and early modern art and science, incorporated this new copy as the centerpiece to his study of the role of artistic thinking uh, in the scientific enterprise, uh, his book Galileo de, de Kunstler. And then in 2012, uh, Bredekamp assembled a team of uh, paper experts, uh, binding experts, early print experts, uh, in order to do a really thorough study of this unique copy of Galileo Sidereus Nuncius. And they published a two-volume uh, study called Galileo's O. Volume one was almost exclusively devoted to uh, the single copy. Volume two by Paul Needham, the uh, Princeton Scheide librarian, uh, probably the, the greatest living bibliographer, uh, an expert mainly on Gutenberg, uh, was a really exhaustive study of the, uh, the printing, the writing and the printing of the Sidereus Nuncius. And we know more now about the Sidereus Nuncius probably than we do of any other uh, printed book, apart from maybe the Gutenberg Bible uh, or maybe the first folio of, of uh, Shakespeare. The main arguments that uh, Bredekamp's team put forward are in Galileo's O are the following. Um, first, that this is Galileo's uh, autograph proof copy. Now that is a very strange term to invoke for a 17th century book, a proof copy. Because um, for those of you not familiar with 17th century printing, these books are made out of, you get lots of little bits of metal with letter impressions on them. You compose them line by line. You assemble those lines one after another. You lock this into a, what's called a form. And then you put ink on it, put some paper, press some paper down, and you have uh, a printed sheet. In the case of Galileo's book, which is a quarto, you have four pages printed on either side of the sheet, so eight pages of text, and then you fold it in the right way, you cut along the edges, and you've got uh, eight pages of text. You do that for your first eight pages, then you do it for your second eight pages, and then your next eight pages, and you work your way through the book. Maybe you have two presses going and two compositors working. What you don't have, even for a short book like Galileo Sidereus Nuncius, is enough type to have. Yeah. Whee. Um, thank you. There we go. Um, what you never have is enough uh, type to have the entire book set up in standing type at one time. Right, so you pr you're printing off your 550 copies of pages 1 to 8, and then you're printing up your 550 copies of pages 9 to 16, et cetera, et cetera. And you're taking apart your type and reusing it. So the idea of a proof copy implies that you print the entire book once, uh, and then you check it, um, and then you make corrections, and then you print everything off, which is what we would do nowadays. But that never happens in the 17th century. Proof copies uh, don't really exist in the 17th century. So this is a kind of slight anachronism uh, as a claim. It would have to be a very weird print shop that would take the first uh, printing of each of these sheets and retain them and assemble them into a, a single physical object rather than just discard them. The next claim that Bredekamp's team made was that the uh, inscription on the book was Gal in Galileo's hand and authentic. We'll go through and analyze each of these one by one. Um, that the Chasey Library stamp was authentic. Uh, sorry, they didn't say that twice, twice I did. Um, they did notice, Paul Needham noticed, that the paper, which was watermarked, uh, 
was extremely similar to the normal paper stock of, of Galileo Sidereus Nuncius, but it wasn't quite the same. There was a slight difference. But Needham said, this just means that maybe the, uh, this was a, a different batch of paper. It's slightly inferior quality, and the watermark's a little different. No real problem there. Uh, and the book is bound not on its own, but along with other Galileo texts, which date from 1656. Needham identified uh, the tooling of the binding and said that this binding came from the Sorrasini family who worked in Rome in the 1630s and 40s, which made a book, the, this binding being around the 1656 book, a bit of a stretch, but maybe the tools had uh, carried on being used for another decade or so. Um, and that there was no evidence of any tampering. The Sidereus Nuncius hadn't, uh, it seemed, nothing had been ripped out and put back in. Uh, the book had been like that since it was first bound, Needham said. Um, Needham also noticed, I think for the first time, that there are textual variants within the print run of Sidereus Nuncius, uh, and that most of these are, or all of these, are present in uh, this copy. Well, I'm going to call this copy SNML because the person who bought this, the company that bought this, is um, ML, Martian Lan. So Sidereus Nuncius Martian Lan, SNML. And Needham noticed that there were a series of typographic errors in SNML which were later rectified in the print run, which was one of the reasons why he thought that this was a proof copy. Um, Bredekamp argued, and this is the really kind of interesting claim, that those watercolor pictures are not just copies of uh, the etchings, that this was one of the blank copies that somebody later got hold of and drew in the moon because it was lacking. But, he argued, using stylistic analysis, these were actually the basis for those etchings. So in his scenario, Galileo had a blank, uh, one of the, the blank, um, sheets, or the, the type was printed, but the blank space was there. And then to instruct the etching mate artist, he d painted in himself what he saw through the telescope, and then handed that over, and then the etchings were made on the basis of, uh, of those drawings. So these epistemologically change everything. This is the first view through the telescope of the moon by Galileo. This is where the scientific revolution happens in these drawings, in this copy. And that's why it was valued at $10 million. Immediately, uh, the um, Harvard historian of, um, of astronomy, um, Owen Gingrich, pointed out that that scenario couldn't work. He said that the lunar illustrations cannot date from the proposed period because the moon simply didn't look like that in the very small window we had between those sheets being printed and the etchings being done. We know almost to the day when each part of this book was uh, printed. And Galileo couldn't have been looking at his telescope on that day because it, wasn't, uh, it just didn't look like that. So he thought that these drawings were probably applied later. They might still be in Galileo's hand, but they don't have this prime epistemological force behind them. And um, what was at stake here was this, uh, this sheet that I'm sure you've all seen reproduced, or maybe actually in the flesh. Uh, this is a, a sheet of what Galileo saw through his telescope that's in the National Library in Florence. Um, Bredekamp said this sheet doesn't matter anymore because we've got the actual observations. This sheet could have been done years later. It's of no relevance to the making of uh, Sidereus Nuncius. And Gingrich said, no, actually, this sheet has always been really, really important for us understanding what Galileo saw, and it still is. And uh, just swiftly to, uh, to show what Gingrich thought was weird about Bredekamp's reconstruction, he pointed out that in Marty and Lan uh, copy, the terminator line, so the line, line between light and dark on the moon, is angled. Um, Whereas in the uh, printed version, it's not. But on this sheet, it is angled. So it, to, um, to Gingrich, it was more likely that that was a copy of that than that being a copy of that. 
He just said, it, there's no real reason to angle that terminator line there. But you could imagine somebody doing these drawings and finding that they had damp, uh, maybe they had some damp uh, watercolor somewhere, and they're turning the sheet round so that they don't get something, um, don't smudge another picture. Uh, whereas here, it makes no, no real sense. So given that there was these doubts cast upon the um, authenticity or chron chronological, uh, the dating of these drawings, I thought, well, what else um, stands up to real scrutiny about this copy? If the drawings, if this was a book that said, I, Galileo, Galileo did this, and there was no it there to do, apart from just writing the book, then uh, we'd better look really, really closely at everything about this book, starting with the most superficial evidence and then working our way kind of down materially into the strata of the, of the book. So with a degree of unparalleled uh, anality, I, um, I decided to do what really should have been done by this team. Uh, they were methodologically pretty, they went pretty fast and loose at times. If you say that this is a genuine Chesey stamp, the bare minimum, I think, as a historian, is to find other Chesey stamps and reproduce them next to it and say, look, it's the same. That never happened in, in Galileo's own. So I went and found examples of uh, Chesey stamps, uh, which had good provenance. Chesey's library was dispersed at his death, and uh, Chesey books, a lot of them were sunk in a ship, uh, but lots of them have ended up nowadays in the libraries of um, Bologna, Montpellier, uh, the new Lynchian Academy in Rome, and uh, the Vatican. So I obtained samples of this uh, Chesey stamp from all of those institutions, and what I found was that it always looked like this. And the thing that caught my eye was that in the inner border here, there's always a break. This would have been made out of wood, and the wood chipped off at some point. Uh, but it seemed to have chipped off very, very early. I couldn't find a single example of that line being intact. This isn't just poorly inked in this one example. Every single library stamp lacks that bit. And you'll notice, you don't have to have link size to notice, that the line is intact in the Martian Lan copy of Sidereus Nuncius. So, and there are other things that are wrong. There's a ligature between the O and the T, which uh, isn't visible there. But you can also see that that's quite poorly inked, whereas in almost all examples this of the genuine stamp, it was applied very firmly and very clearly. Next up, so I thought, well, that provenance just doesn't, doesn't cut it for me. Um, what about the signature? If the book doesn't have Galileo's pictures and didn't belong to Chesey, what's the status of the signature? Well, you'll all have seen this one before. Uh, this is your copy. Um, <laughs> this is the, and it's genuine. Um, this is the only uh, dedicatory copy of the Sidereus Nuntius uh, currently known. Um, and we, can, uh, we know because uh, the poet uh, Chiabrera was in the process of writing nice uh, Baroque style fawning verse about what a great guy Galileo was. We know that the book was sent to uh, Chiabrera probably in early 1610. So this is Galileo's signature in 1610. And I just don't think that that uh, looks anything like it. I mean, I'm not a trained uh, handwriting expert. But the, the ways that, that, say, the capital G's uh, move is just completely different. Um, Paul Needham didn't notice that, it, uh, that the SNML signature is extremely similar to uh, this Galileo Galileo signature, which we hope is genuine because this is his abjuration certificate from 1633. And if that was forged, then there's the biggest cover-up since JFK, <laughs> or before JFK. Um, and if you look at the uh, national edition of Galileo's works where this uh, signature was reproduced, it had been reproduced in facsimile from the mid-19th century onwards, uh, you'll see that the match is perfect. Somebody used this signature as a template, even down to the EO, with what I think was probably just a little blot on the paper they mistook as a cross line. Um, and the, they got a bit worried about writing um, 
manu propria, uh, so they just did an F and they were kind of running out of ink there anyway. And what's more, you can see that there's a kind of, you see the kind of scratch mark that's left in that F. Well, Bredekam said this shows the passioned uh, young Galileo with the flourish of his quill. Quills are really, really soft. If you write with a quill and the ink runs out, you don't scratch a mark into a piece of paper. You need a metal nib to leave a mark like that. That wasn't done with a quill. And metal pens don't really come into handwriting use for uh, another century or so. So that's a little awkward. <laughs> now, at this stage of my, so I was writing a review of Galileo Zo and thinking, I, I wrote a first draft where I said, brilliant, you know, uh, free book for me, and the world of scholarship now has this really important document. I then uh, started to hear stories in the Italian press about a guy I'd heard rumors about before, the, the guy on your right, Massimo De Caro. Um, usually this picture's cropped, the priest is taken out of it, and it looks like he has a three hands, one of them for stealing books. Um, he's, at this point, he was the director of this library. This is the Girolamini Library in Naples, uh, founded in the 1580s, wonderful, used to be a wonderful, rich library. Uh, the story that was breaking in, 20, in 2012 was that library workers, bless you, had noticed that books were going missing from the library. And one of them felt uncomfortable about the instruction he'd received from the director, Massimo De Caro, to turn off the security cameras at night. So he uh, brilliantly <laughs> just uh, left them running and videotaped a feed, um, sent a feed out to the police. And, um, and caught on camera Massimo De Caro coming back to the library after hours, not because he was so, such a good worker, but to load up boxes and boxes of 15th and 16th and 17th century books into his van and remove them from the library. Um, it turns out De Caro's now in jail, or he's not actually in jail, he's, un, he's uh, in his own house, uh, in house imprisonment for seven years for stealing four and a half thousand rare books from, yeah, um, which is actually really, really lenient. Think of the cultural patrimony damage. Only about a thousand of those have, have actually been retrieved. That library will never get its books back. And he stole, he's now admitted to stealing from about five other libraries, including libraries in Florence. Um, and he gets seven years for that. And presumably he has safety deposit boxes all over the place with uh, books in. Anyway. So this story was, um, was breaking, and that made me wonder whether there was some kind of relationship between the De Caro story breaking and rumors that I'd been hearing, which I'll show you how they fit together um, uh, very soon. I started trying to find out more about De Caro because he seemed like such a larger-than-life character, not in a good way. Um, and I'd heard that he'd been suspected of stealing books for quite a while, and that also um, he'd done some pretty weird book deals, uh, not necessarily involving theft, but just very unorthodox. And that lots of book dealers were very, very willing to talk to me about him because they resented him so much, mainly because of this deal. So on the 13th of February 2003, uh, Massimo De Caro received from the Vatican Library uh, this list of books uh, on the, the left. Um, in return, he gave them, there was no cash involved, but in return he gave them 13 books uh, whose total value is no more than $100,000. This is the, those are the crass terms we have to understand this exchange in. The Vatican got about $100,000 worth of books, and in exchange they gave away um, a copy of Galileo's Compasso, uh, you have one of those. You have a beautiful one of those. There are maybe 20 copies of that known in the world. Uh, you could probably sell that tomorrow for uh, three quarters of a million dollars. Uh, Barberini family's copy of Il Saggiatore, the Barberini, Pope Urban VIII's copy of the Dialogo, the Pope who condemned Galileo, his personal copy of uh, the Dialogo, the Barberini copy of the Discorsi, uh, and then just for good measure, the Hypnorotomachia polyphily, uh, which is 
uh, the most beautiful book printed by Aldous Minutius. Um, that's a million dollars right there. And uh, Lactantius's opera, the first book printed in Italy. Total value there, to put it in crass terms, but that's where we're, uh, we're brought by this kind of person, is probably four to five million dollars in exchange for $100,000. The Vatican denies that this exchange took place, but it did. I've seen some of these books. I know where they are. And if you ask for them in the Vatican now, shamefully, you're told that they're uh, temporarily uh, misplaced. Now, the first of those books, the Operazione del Compasso, uh, was microfilmed because it was part of the uh, Cicognara collection, which was microfilmed in its entirety in the 1980s. So we actually have a picture of every page of that individual copy. And you'll notice that the title page of it has uh, a Lynchian stamp. This is a genuine one photographed in the 1980s. And that Lynchian stamp, I think, is really, really important because it provides a, uh, a template for De Caro. He gets hold of this book in 2003. And then um, in 2005, two things start to happen. First, the market becomes flooded with books with Lynchian stamps, which had hardly been on the market at all in the preceding 50 years. But there was a story about some Argentinian descendant of uh, Chesi, completely implausible, uh, who, because of the stock market crash in Argentina, in the, or the currency uh, crisis in Argentina in the 80s, was being forced to sell off this fabulous private library. Um, and that this was, uh, that all these Chesi books were coming out of Argentina. Um, this, I think, was the basis for the forged stamps. And there are still books. I saw a book at the Library of Congress uh, a couple of months ago uh, that they're trying to return to the Italian dealers they bought it from, an Arabic Euclid. You have a lovely copy on display here that has ch fake Chasey stamps throughout it. There are probably 30 or 40 books going around with fake Chasey stamps. Genuine books, uh, put the stamp in and you add $10,000 to the, uh, the price. Um, not, not bad for a day's work. Um, the other thing that happened in 2005 is that several copies of the Compasso, a rare book, 20-ish 20, 20 copies known, one copy comes up for sale maybe every decade. In 2005, three copies came onto the market of this book. And um, one private collector commissioned Owen Gingrich and uh, the paper conservator at the Folger Library at the time, a guy called Frank Mowry, to look very closely he bought the first copy that he was offered, because this is a chance in a lifetime. And then another one came along, and then another one came along, and he got very suspicious. So he asked these two experts to look very, very closely at uh, these copies. And they found that not only were the watermarks wonky, but they also noticed, both of them, that on the dedicatory letter, there is this weird, weird typographical uh, impossibility. If you're printing a book with uh, pieces of metal, bits of type, there's no way that you can get this kind of lateral shift like that. The only way that you can produce a shift like that, you can see that there's no crease in the paper. Right? This is uh, an uncreased piece of paper, but there's, um, these two words have this kind of shearing going on there. Now, the only two ways I can think of getting that uh, to happen are uh, that you are photographing an original that kind of had got crumpled at that point and then got unfolded. Um, and then you're printing from a photograph. Or maybe while somebody is scanning, uh, the, there's some kind of lateral movement of a scanner going on here, and then somebody bumps into the scanner. And there's a little um, kind of blip of information there that produces this artifact. And then you print from that. But neither of these can be produced using typeface in a 17th century print shop. So this was revealed to be a fake. Unfortunately, neither Maori nor Gingrich were at liberty to publish their results. The private collector is very, very private and didn't want the larger world to know about it, although lots of book dealers heard this story. Um, unfortunately, Bredekamp and his team did not. I went looking um, for a 
control copy to see what the text should look like at that point. And I wrote to, um, in the Italian online catalog, there were two libraries listed with copies of the 1606 Compasso. I wrote to the first one in Padua, and I said, could you just send me a picture of, your, um, of that page? I didn't explain why. And to my surprise, uh, their copy also has this dog leg break. This was meant to be my test copy, my control copy to, uh, to work out what was going on. So I, I thought, well, maybe there is some typographic impossibility that I just don't understand. So I asked where this book came from, and they said, well, interestingly, there was this guy, Massimo De Caro, who used to visit our library, and he discovered this copy in 2005. Um, and by the way, at the same time, 13 incunables uh, were stolen, worth uh, over a million dollars. So that's where our copy comes from. The librarian was a little suspicious about this weirdo who just wanted to look at these two words in his book. So he wrote to the other library, which had a, um, a compasso, Monte Cassino, 12th century library. They've had their copy since the 1890s, at least. It turned out that their, uh, sorry, um, their library copy also had the same dogleg break. We asked around there, and they said, oh, we had this guy, the last time anyone looked at this copy was this guy, Marino Massimo De Caro, who came in, uh, and now that we look at it, our copy uh, has uh, super glue. It, something's been ripped out and this copy has been stuck in. This is a forgery that has replaced our, our um, genuine copy, which is now missing and is still missing and unrecovered. At this point I was getting uh, not only curious but quite angry. Um, so I thought, well, okay, in 2005 these three copies of the um, Compasso have come onto the market. Could this, and they all seem to um, when I asked dealers where they came from, after a little resistance, I found out that they all seemed to lead back through various circuitous routes to the same guy, Massimo De Caro, who at the same time was falling from grace uh, as the master thief of the Girolamini library thefts. I thought, could this have anything to do with the uh, Sideris Nuncius, which also came on the market in 2005? I don't believe that the stamp is genuine. I don't believe that the, um, that the signature is genuine. I don't believe that the pictures are genuine. Could, if the Compasso is actually a forgery, could the whole of the Sideris Nuncius actually be a forgery? And to answer that question, I needed to put together in the right relationship a series of copies of the Sideris Nuncius. So the first, uh, this had, hadn't been noticed before, but in 2005, another copy of the Sideris Nuncius was offered a, uh, for sale by Sotheby's, New York. They described their copy as a curious hybrid, by which they meant that the type is all genuine, but where there are those moon etchings, their copy, they say, had been completed in facsimile. Now, no other copy is known to be in that state, but it's not impossible for a 19th century collector um, to have... Uh, blanks there and think, I want my copy to look like the other copies, uh, and to commission someone to print in facsimiles. Um, that copy didn't sell because it was so weird, um, and it disappeared. But we did, I did still have Sotheby's photos of, of the title page and um, a couple of other pages of that copy to work from. It turned out uh, very indiscreetly with the um, culture of confidentiality, somebody at Sotheby's told me where that copy came from, Massimo De Caro. Interesting, I thought. Um, the other copies that I needed to put together was a genuine copy in Milan, in the Brera, a 1964 uh, facsimile copy, and a copy that was also a genuine copy that was offered for sale also in 2005 by the French dealer Patrick Sauget which has now uh, disappeared. He claims the police have seized it, but uh, I think he's probably lying. This is being recorded, right? Yeah. <laughs> okay, so I thought I would, I had these title pages to work from, and I thought, uh, if this thing is a forgery, there must be something that you could, that will reveal its forged status on any single page. And I happen to have, uh, from the Sotheby's catalog, I have a pretty good picture of the title page. So let's just see whether the title, a comparison of title pages 
can tell me something. And I locked myself in my basement and stared at Im these two images, the Sotheby's 2005 title page and the digital image of the um, SNML until um, white smoke came out of my head. <laughs> you got it, thank you. Um, the first thing I noticed was that there was a curious little dot over the L of Galileo. And I thought, well, that's just an ink splodge. Print shops are messy places. Um, but then when I looked at the Sotheby's copy, I noticed that the same ink splodge was there, which meant that it had to be printed. You don't get random ink happening to land in, uh, on two separate copies in the same way. This must have been an artifact of printing. And if you think of a metal piece of type that's been cast, there has to have been a pretty massive rupture. I'll do it backwards for you like this, because that's how the letter would look. No, yes. Uh, so some kind of something in the mold in the making of that letter, there'd have to be a little pillar sticking up there, which was never filed away. Not impossible, but weird. And why in these two copies? If this is a proof copy, unique and wonderful in its uh, in its uniqueness. Why is it also in this other copy that also appears in 2005? All genuine copies didn't have that little dot. So somebody noticed, you know, in the proof copy scenario, somebody, this copy was printed, that copy was printed, and then they noticed it. So this must be a, the second proof copy. Um, the next thing I noticed hadn't been noticed by uh, Bredekamp or his team, that there's actually a typographic error. This is actually favoring their argument of proof copy status. There's a big typo on the title page. Instead of say, talking about the periods of the satellites of Jupiter, uh, the periodis, this copy, the SNML, says pepiodis. Uh, and I hope you can see that, weirdly, the P and the I are almost touching there. Typographic characters are lumps of metal and the only way that you can get the body of the character to touch is to file the sides away uh, until the characters um, come next to each other. And there's no reason to do that. Or have extremely damaged type. Or cast a ligature where P and I need to be right next to each other. Um, normally, in every other genuine copy, the R is there, periodis. You can see as well that the, the sender of the P doesn't go down far enough. It's a very weird letter. Genuine copies always have the R intact. The Sotheby's copy has that same weird P typo. So we are dealing with kind of Shakespearean twins, apart from it's a tragedy, not a comedy. There's something weird about the, the relationship between the Sotheby's copy and the SNML. They have all the, the same set of anomalies that are meant to be unique uh, to SNML. How am I doing for time? OK. Um, next up. And this was the clincher. This was the, uh, the piece of evidence that um, really allowed me to put a, a, a firm kind of time stamp on uh, what was going on and, and, and really convince uh, slowly everybody in the, in the team that uh, we were dealing with something not at all kosher. Um, I noticed that there was a weird kind of club foot to the letter P of privilegio there. And again, I thought, maybe it's a smudge of ink. I asked Paul Needham to look at it, and he said, no, actually, you can, you can put your finger in that. That's deeply impressed into the paper. Um, so there must have been a typographic character that, went, that had a, a load of molten le lead kind of splurging out, out of the side somehow that left that, that mark. I didn't like that explanation. I decided to compare. I knew that I'd seen that, uh, that mark before um, because I had that weird kind of memory for images. Um, and it turned out that it was in the 1964 facsimile printed in, in Pisa. Um, I went looking to see where else that mark appeared. Where did the Pisa copy come from? And the first place, as a good historian, I went to look was Wikipedia. Uh, <laughs> The wiki image, this has now been removed, but the wiki image used to have that same mark. And if you look through the file history of that image, it says it's actually based on the 1964 facsimile, not a genuine copy. So um, the Sotheby's copy, predictably enough, also had that weird mark. Genuine copies never had that real mark. However many I looked at, I could never find anything that was weird about that P. 
So the question was, chronologically, uh, the furthest back we can push uh, this club foot appearing is 1964. Where did it come from? What was the origin of, uh, of that facsimile copy? And it turned out that it came from a copy in Milan. That's where that facsimile was made, made from. And if you look closely, what you see is that there's no weird misformed typographical character. What there is is some foxing on the paper. The paper has a brown mark in it, probably with time, the acidity in the paper has reacted with air and it's oxidized and made this kind of rust splodge. When that brown mark was photographed in 1964 to make the facsimile, black and white photography ha uh, had to decide, is this white or is this black? Comes out black. Photo retoucher should have whited that out, missed it. If this came into existence as a mark in 1964, what is it doing on, a, uh, on the SNML copy and the Sotheby's copy? They must logically post date 1964. Agreed? Yeah, thank you. Well, so that's the, that was my, that was for me one of the most exciting, mo after birth of children and marriage and election, that was a, you're not, you've obviously had much more exciting lives than me. That was my eureka moment where I realized, okay, I've got it. I've got the material evidence that post dates this to 1964, proves that this is a forgery. Um, and you can see the contours of the line match uh, the darker section of that, um, that image quite nicely. I took this evidence to Paul Needham and Horst Bredekamp. Uh, Bredekamp said, if SNML is a forgery, then the discipline of history of science can close its doors. Seemed a little exaggerated to me. Uh, he didn't want to parley, it seemed. Uh, Needham was much, uh, was a, a model of scholarly um, discussion, collaboration. He resisted to a certain amount, but only because he's so skeptical. Um, he immediately pointed out that the SNML is not just a facsimile reprint of, uh, of the facsimile of the 1964 facsimile. There are other things that don't match at all. And in order to work out what SNML was, I needed to find another copy. So somebody sent me an image from this 2005 catalog entry from uh, Patrick Sorge's uh, catalog, uh, Price Upon Request. Um, and you'll the first thing you'll notice is that this copy has, has the measles. It's quite heavily foxed, all these little dots all over it. And I couldn't help but noticing <coughs> that some of those dots were in interesting places. The dot over the L precisely matches SNML's dot over the L. You'll see that there are lots of other dots that don't match, but uh, what looks like a full stop when it's not a full stop is reproduced in SNML. Um, what this little blotch on the letter M isn't there in genuine copies. It's a paper uh, discoloration again, and yet it appears in SNML. Um, and most spectacularly in the woodcut, where I assume these things are hardest to edit away or spot, you'll see, uh, so this is Sorge copy, genuine. This is SNML, uh, not genuine. You'll notice that a whole series of these marks have just been uh, reproduced over and over. So why then did the forgery not just reprint the Sorge copy, if that was its main source? That really puzzled me. And what you see is that the Sorge copy has this weird abrasion uh, on the words uh, permesso et privilegio. Something has been, I think, rubbed away there. And I suspect what was rubbed away was a library, an institutional library mark uh, to cover up a theft. Uh, I'd love to know where that, this book came from, Mr. Sorge, if you're watching this, Phil. Uh, and there's this... Um, <laughs> There's another library mark that I can't identify there. I think it's BV uh, or SV, uh, which has been placed there, I think, to distract the eye away from that abrasion. So you can't just print from Sorge copy. The Sorge copy I know belonged to Decaro uh, in 2004, although it's unclear who sold it to whom. Uh, they both claim that they bought it from each other and sold it back to each other. It's um, kind of Keystone Cops routine. Um, so what I think happened was that for just this unusable bit, uh, the facsimile was called upon to digitally splice in a better uh, text, although they chose just the wrong bit of text because it was the smoking gun that showed that, uh, that it was based on a um, facsimile. And you can actually prove that this is a, a piece of digital splicing by 
uh, thinking about the way that uh, the images and text work together in a, in a print shop. So here, if you draw a line, these are four genuine copies. If you draw a line through the wood block and see where it intersects with the uh, imprimatur um, text at the bottom, that relationship shouldn't change. All of this stuff is locked in together physically. The wood block sits there, the type sits underneath. It shouldn't wobble about if, if uh, the print shop is operating well. Or if it does wobble around, you should see wobble in a random selection of copies. So I'm just showing you four here. I did this with many more. You'll see that if you just draw a line from nose to nose, it intersects between the M and the A of the, of the name Tom Tommaso every time. If you then bring in the um, SNML and uh, Sotheby's copies, you'll see that there's a slight displacement there where the digital <coughs> splicing hasn't quite matched up correctly. Um, so we're dealing with digital editing of images, composite images, uh, and uh, quite a high level, but not high level enough, of, um, of digital retouching of images to make these forgeries. Um, oh, running out of time, but very, very quickly. We can't do this kind of analysis on every book that we're a little bit suspicious of. So we need some basic take-home messages of things that don't work with this kind of forgery. What I would, thought might be interesting would be to look at the bits of the printed page which are not meant to be printed. Anybody who's handled 17th century books or looked at them will notice that there's a certain amount of noise as well as signal. There are little smudges and marks made with printer's ink that are not the impressed with typographic characters. And they're because in the furniture, the spacing bars around a composed, uh, a composed type, ink sometimes gets onto those areas and there's nothing to stop some paper just lightly kissing those areas. If you're using a photopolymer plate, which is how we think De Caro did his forgeries, um, you don't have any furniture like that. The image is, you take a black and white picture, you expose this, uh, you stick it to a plastic light sensitive plate, you expose it to light, same stuff they use on your teeth at the dentist, UV light hardens exposed areas, the rest of it washes away, and you're left with a plate. It costs 10 bucks a plate. Um, you don't have this kind of range of, things are either stand proud or they're flat. So if we mentally reconstruct, do a Galilean thought experiment of these two printing processes, what kind of artifacts do we produce? Here is uh, a 16th, 17th century uh, composed type. And what I'm interested in is that kind of ink there, nooks and cranny ink. Print from that and you will get uh, a fake printed backwards uh, because of things reversed. But you'll also, the paper might well touch and get a little line of ink with no, no force behind it, no impression. So what we need to distinguish is between inking and impression as two different um, artifacts. If you then take a picture of that printed page and turn it into a photopolymer plate, the plate will just, all the plate does is turn a two-dimensional black and white image into a three-dimensional printing uh, plate. So it doesn't distinguish between the shoulder ink, as we call it, and typographic characters in any way. Print from this, and what you will find is that the typographic characters and the shoulder ink are impressed with the same depth. Does that make sense? This hadn't been um, kind of thought through, I think, before at all. And Needham uh, had this, um, w we argued about whether this was uh, admissible evidence or not. But when you go to actual copies, it quickly becomes very clear that this is really good evidence. What we've got here is the Library of Congress uh, copy of the Sedaris Lynch's brilliant copy, uncut, uh, $1.1 million. Um, and what I'm talking about is this kind of, um, no, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about that little line at the top, shoulder ink. What I've done here is take the reverse of, so this is 3R, flip that page over, and then I've digitally flipped that around. So what I was hoping we would see is either the impression of characters through. You can see 
you can just see, this isn't just um, the ink showing through, this is actually, maybe you can't see, but trust me. Um, you can see there's a number three that you, can, uh, you could feel on the reverse of the page, where the typographic characters have been have pushed into the paper with force, and you can uh, feel them on the reverse. But where the shoulder ink is, there's obviously, there is no impression there. It's completely invisible. By marked contrast, if we look at the Marty and Land copy, there's very little shoulder ink. It's a peculiarly clean copy. But when there is shoulder ink, it's very uh, deeply impressed. So here we have uh, the same thing, 4R. And then I've looked at the back, 4 Verso, and flipped it over. So you can actually see how deeply impressed you could read this uh, in backwards, you know, uh, through the back of the page. But what you'll see is that the shouldering is impressed with exactly the same depth. And hopefully, this, can, this is a, Kerry just gave me this picture. This is a beautiful example of that. It's fantastic. You see that with raking light, that line just stands up uh, in a way that shouldn't have any impression behind it. That should be completely invisible. So this is a way that the photopolymer printing process and the whole photomechanical photomechan reproduction process reveals itself. This is, I'm afraid, the best we've got for spotting these kinds of fakes at the moment, and I know how to get rid of that. In, you, know, you just wipe that out and then stipple it in with a paintbrush. There, you can all produce $10 million forgeries now. <laughs> just to wrap up very, oh, I'm uh, way out of time. Um, although all the press attention has been on this spectacular, unique $10 million forgery, and Bredekamp has actually argued you know, the copy was so, the forgery was so good that even I, Horst Bredekamp, was duped by it, uh, there was no methodological failure by my team at any point. Um, this isn't uh, a story about somebody challenging academia or um, an outsider trying to uh, do an emperor's no, um, no clothes routine on, on academics. And this isn't a story about hoaxes. This is a story about theft, organized crime, and forgery. And we should take it really, really seriously. Um, just to conclude, this is the list of books that we currently know uh, were forged by Decaro, and I suspect there are others. So we have in, in the um, Verona, one of the very, very few copies of this super uh, rare book, the Dialogo di Cecco di Ronchiti, pseudonymously authored by Galileo. Maybe five copies, six copies in the world. Their copy's gone, and basically a crude photocopy is in its place, and Decaro hung out there a lot. The Compasso. Uh, there are at least five forgeries around, and I only know where two of them are now. Um, Sidereus Nuncius, the National Library of Naples had its uh, fine paper copy stolen, and uh, Decaro left a forgery in its place, with the right provenance notes all marked in. Um, he didn't do a bad job there. And then there are even obs totally obscure texts, like this Peruvian um, imprint from 1650, a Spanish translation of an Italian early biography of Galileo. There's only one copy of that known in the world. Um, De Caro uh, managed to sell to Martin Land two copies, one of which is now in the John Carter Brown Library. They've got their money back and they're keeping it as a teaching aid forgery, brilliantly. The other one is in the National Library of Madrid. In their catalog, it's still listed as the genuine thing. So we're facing a kind of uh, forgery abyss, I think. Um, I have no bridge to go anywhere. I make clear that the photograph I provided was not of our copy. <laughs> Even though it does seem somewhat risky to bring someone like uh, Professor Wilder to examine the books in our collection. But uh, Inspector Colum, I mean, uh, <laughs> Dr. Wilding, would, would you go ahead and take a few questions? Certainly, I'd love to. They did that. Uh, and all you have to do, I mean, what DeCaro claimed was that he'd got hold of some, um, well, they, they did it for the ink in the drawings, but they didn't do it for the uh, typographic ink because they basically, they thought that it was impossible to forge a book for some reason. Books have been forged since uh, 1498, was the first one I know of. Um, 
So um, there's been a long history of book forging, but uh, for some reason it was considered just impossible that this book could be a forgery. So they only did ink analysis. No, they did ink analysis on the printing ink and it had enough iron in it to be old. You could do a destructive test on the paper, but if this is a $10 million object, very few owners want a quarter inch even clipping out and burning. So um, they ran the standard kind of scientific test. Apart from, they went in super high tech and did all this 3D microscopy. And, um, and then after I showed that it was a forgery, the paper experts above all said, the paper is genuine 17th century paper. And then DeCaro said, no, I, I made it. Um, and I can show you how to make it. You just follow the recipe. And then they went in with a low powered microscope and what they found was that actually the cotton fibers in that, in that paper, cotton doesn't come in to paper uh, for another two centuries. So they should have just, you know, there's some, and the other, the other way of testing this kind of thing is just um, familiarity with material objects. I mean, digitization is fantastic, and it's fantastic also as a conservation aid, but we also need to carry on handling the originals. One of the dealers who was offered SNML picked it up, touched the paper, and said, that paper doesn't move, doesn't feel, and doesn't sound like 17th century paper. I'm, it could have had some peculiar storage history that's rendered it kind of thick and brittle and weird, but I just don't like it. I'm not even going to look at it. So that kind of other forms of expertise, I think, need to get admitted. We rely a lot on science to save us, but it needs to be a, a set of um, bibliographic questions that are supplemented by the right kind of scientific tests and not just this kind of, these are the tests we do on any book and they'll tell us the truth about it. I'm uh, wondering about your legal liabilities on, uh, in some cases, if found as sound as your uh, analysis is and true as it ultimately is, that uh, many of these uh, collections and libraries uh, where you find these things, they're uh, being damaged dramatically. Are you being sued very often? Uh, no. <laughs> Not yet, no. But I do think that as this problem grows, and presumably it will grow, because there's no reason why, um, you know, given the kind of silly money that rare books are now attracting, and that's that I think is a direct offshoot of dot-com silly money as well. Um, there are, uh, Library of Congress spending a million dollars on the Sedaris Ninjas, that's an insane <laughs> amount of money. I saw one at uh, Wellesley College that was bought in 1950. So that's a while ago, but it cost them five bucks in 1950. Book prices shouldn't have gone up that much, and they've gone up more steeply in history of science than they have in other domains, and that's because of the kind of money the tech money that's being thrown at it, private investors mainly, that are forcing universities out of competition, which is another thing I find disgraceful. Anyway, um, uh, nobody yet, uh, uh, what was I, in the, so I think we're gonna see more book forgeries, um, and presumably we'll end up in a similar situation to the art market, where academics are getting sued, even for not offering a verdict um, on an object. You can now get sued as an academic for refusing to say whether you think a work should be in an artist's oeuvre or not, which is also insane. Um, so, so far everyone's been pretty cooperative with me because they want to know what's genuine and what's not, and they realize that the integ integrity of the historical record is worth defending and that we can't just open this up to free market criminality. Um, but whether at some point either I make a wrong call or, um, or somebody, uh, yeah, let's just hope it doesn't happen. <laughs> Any further questions? Can forgeries in time develop their own value? Certainly, yes, good question. Uh, yeah, Martin Land, uh, the company, still owns this, th this object. They paid half a million dollars for it. I hope it's not worth that as a forgery, but it's surely worth something. Uh, there are, I mean, in the art world, again, 
uh, which is kind of more developed in this way, if that's the right term, you see people who collect fake Warhols, because there are good fake Warhols and bad fake Warhols. Um, forgery is a very interesting kind of shadow to the, uh, I mean, if, uh, both as, as teaching objects where they really bring into relief the kinds of skills that we need to hone in order to understand uh, how the original objects are made. I mean, basically what you just saw was me, I guess what I was doing was kind of making visible everything that we subconsciously don't look at in the book. Um, and that actually reveals a lot about how the book was actually made. We start to ask questions of the original object. So there's, there's both epistemological value in the forgery. Um, in terms of financial uh, value, I don't know of anyone yet who's, well, no, some, some uh, institutions are actively collecting forgeries because they want those things, A, off the market, uh, and B, in their teaching collections so that they can, they can use them. Um, I mean, there's a long history of collecting forgery, content-based forgery. Uh, so people collecting all the, um, the Shakespeare forged manuscripts, that kind of stuff, um, uh, which has culminated recently. The Johns Hopkins Library bought this collection uh, called, that they call the Bibliotheca Fictiva. And that's basically every book that's ever discussed forgery or uh, embodied forgery. That doesn't include material forgeries like that. I don't know if anyone's, yeah, get in now, they're cheap, <laughs> I guess. I'll be honest, no. Um, and in fact, one of, the, one of the parties who was, I think, involved, where am I legally here? Um, I was shown recently a book um, which had an inscription, a Chasey inscription. Yeah, what the hell. Um, and uh, the Chasey inscription, and, and it had a, a fake Chasey stamp on the, uh, on the title page of the book. And then there was an end leaf that had this nice Chasey um, autograph inscription. And it was being argued that even if the Chasey library stamp was now known to be a fake, the inscription was still genuine and that piece of paper belonged to the book, even though the dimensions of it were totally wrong. Uh, and one of the things that my, gui my eye was guided towards by the collector was a wormhole for these little bugs that there's a, a great one on, on display. Uh, they love eating paper. Uh, bibliographers can use wormholes as evidence to see when books have been messed around with. If you take a book that has a wormhole going through it and you marry it with, and then the book uh, stops at that point, but you want a complete copy and you put in another book, the wormhole's going to stop, right? So you can use wormholes as evidence of telling you something about the history of a book. This. Uh, this book had a wormhole through the in, uh, inscription page, and then it went into the textbook. And I thought, oh, great. So that sheet of paper at least has been with this book for probably a long time. I then followed the worm, went down the, the wormhole, uh, went through about seven pages following it, expecting it to start turning and, and coming back up at some point, and it didn't. It stopped. And where it stopped, uh, I noticed that the next page then had a pressure point in there, a deep pressure point, and the next page, and the next page. And this wormhole, I think, had been drilled. There's definitely no parasite can exert pressure like that by eating. So this was a fake wormhole, and I'd been told to look at it uh, by somebody who thought that it would be the clincher. So I think that's, in terms of a kind of Lance Armstrong cat and mouse game, um, I stupidly said to the guy, oh yeah, that's a fake wormhole and presumably um, other tools are now, I'm very close to libel here. Um, <laughs> some people might be developing other tools, which I, I probably won't be able to detect. I mean, there's, you have to make up the 
questions on the fly. Nobody knows how to spot these things. If Paul Needham couldn't spot this, uh, the world's greatest bibliographer couldn't spot this having worked on it for a couple of years, then you know, the level of forgery is really, really scary. One last, do we have time? I think you have his hand. Ask me afterwards. Yeah, there's no. Right. This this is not. Yeah. This is, these works don't mess with the content. Although alongside, it's not just inscriptions that are being added to give fake provenance. There have been a lot of Galilean documents that have emerged with, say, Kepler marginalia in them that I suspect were produced within the last 10 years. Um, there's also, this is something that I've just started to see in a couple of, um, a couple of examples recently. Digital, so catalogs reproducing title pages of books that don't actually exist, which I'm completely flummoxed by what, what like when you actually go to the auction, they just say, oh, that lot's not available. But their catalog reproduces an image, and they are unknown imprints. And I think it's meant to kind of drum up interest in, in the larger lot. I don't know if that's a criminal activity. It's definitely false advertising. But there you get, um, so they always claim that they're quite obviously made up and that this is a, a time-honored um, bookseller's trade of hoaxing the uh, the potential buyers and that everybody's in on it, so it's not fraudulent, fraudulent or deceptive. The weird thing, so Mart the Martian land copy, in one seen from one point of view, is the kind of material instantation of a digital facsimile. Um, now that doesn't mean, and, and that that has led some people when I've given this talk to say, should we stop digitizing books? Right? If all if all of this was produced using digital technology then you are insane to put up digital books in high-res, free, open-access images because you're just giving the tools to the forger. I'd just like to say, although theoretically you could use these images, there's no evidence that any of these forgeries were ever used by, um, based on institutional copies. They were always books that the individual owned and that they... Um, they usually took the book apart and photographed it under whatever conditions they wanted. I don't think there's anything in this and that would make digitizing and open access a bad idea. And I think actually digital humanities were the tool that allowed me to find this forgery um, and that the benefits outweigh any risk massively. That wasn't answering your question, but that's just something else I wanted to say about how laudable the projects here are. I think we're probably out of time. Thank you. Appreciate that. Thank I you.